I am super excited to see you, Poppy. I am such a fan of yours, such a big fan girl. I feel the same way that Nicole did. Um, <laughs> the first time I came across you, which I think was two years ago at the Brain Mind Symposium at Stanford, I think is where we actually finally met. Um, but I'm super interested because, um, you know, this week I've been um, thinking about uh, the biological effects of physical energy and um, new modalities of, he of healing like radiation and light and radio frequency. We just did a story on focused ultrasound, um, but magnetism, like all these things, which, um, you know, there's anecdotal evidence that they are effective, mm -hmm. uh, but you actually know whether they're effective or not. You have this incredible background, you know, a, a, Physi uh, physiologist, a neurophysicist, a uh, neuroscientist. You've just been studying both the um, the gray matter, you know, and the the software that makes the gray matter work. And so, I think it's really important for a community like TransTech, you know, to be grounded in what's actually, you know, provable, what we can see working, and what we can uh, what we can demonstrate. So, I'm really excited to talk to you about this stuff and. You know, I want to just start off by saying, um, you know, we're spending so much time on in video conferencing and we're also at peak. I don't know about you, but I feel like I am at peak exhaustion, peak like pandemic exhaustion right now. And um, I'm also at peak participation in video conferencing right now. <laughs> Why is this so exhausting to us? What is happening in our brains that is so taxing? Well, I mean, I, I, I think everyone's heard about Zoom fatigue. And so that's, it, it, but it's not, you know, obviously we're, we're losing the micro expressions. We're building ourselves into one size fits all boxes, but it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, there's something that I think is really uh, interesting in terms of, you know, what we're enabled right now. Clearly we're, there's so much capability in communication that we have today that we didn't have 10 years ago, but uh, there's a, um, uh, there's a quote from one of my favorite cellists, Pablo Casals. You might might know him. Uh, he he always said that the music happens uh, between the notes. It's how we go from note to note, right? And the different the things that we're doing right now in our communication that our brains just aren't used to is um, how we exchange. You know, the dialogue, the success of our communication is is how we get from note to note. You know, how that th that that dance between each other happens and. Our, our one size fits all platforms right now sort of, you know, they put us in low boxes, they democratize um, everyone, but that, that's not what happens in, in a normal environment. It's all the subtle cues and the ways of interrupt and the ways of um, exchanging uh, and picking up on the overt and both the not non-overt uh, metrics of communication and building a, you know, enabling sort of a continuum of interaction. So I think there's a lot of uh, great opportunity with regard to empathetic technology for how we uh, move forward in these ways and we're able to exchange uh, information. So I love the fact that you started off talking about music, right? Because you're a violinist, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I yeah, know. And, um, you know, I think it, it's, there's, it, so there, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there's, right now I think about when, um, when you, in music, for example, you know, one of the beauties of a musician or someone who is, you know, spends their life in sound is the plasticity that happens in our brains or happens in anyone's brains. Every time, you know, you become an expert in something, your brain enables you to do something different. And it, it, one of the things with musicians is that tracking of polyphony, that understanding of how you zoom in and out of different notes. And that's what my, in the sort of one size fits all communication platform, our brains can't do that. And, you know, one of the things that I've realized in the, you know, over the last six months is the importance of, you know, entering into different types of platforms of communication. You've got, um, it, it, whether it's the, the communication streams we're on now, or even when you go into something like all, uh, VR and, and some of the, you know, platforms where you get to suddenly engage in a very different way. Um, we were talking about this earlier, uh, having even your teams meet in and interacting with people in alt space VR, which might be a, a kind of clunky, you know, virtual reality avatars interacting, but it's completely liberating when suddenly your brain can have divided attention 
and your brain can have agency of interaction. You, because of the spatial audio in those environments, you can move between your conversations and you can eavesdrop. And our brains want to do that so badly. Um, so that's one of the, you know, it's like how- What do you mean want to eavesdrop? What, what do you mean? <laughs> that's really intriguing. I mean, that, that's what, I mean, that's what musicians do when they listen to a piece of music. They, they, you know, they're moving between the different, different lines. We're doing the same things in our conversations, in our, in our cacophonous party of, you know, perceptual environments. And, you know, it, it, we're exceptionally good at it as humans, right? And understanding how our brain takes apart those sonic scenes and can zoom in on one element or why our brain unpacks, you know, literally unpacks those frequencies and amalgamates them back together is, you know, this incredibly beautiful process. But then we're able to hear multiple streams at the same time. The same thing that lets us, re ways we're able to experience, you know, a, a Bach cello solo are also part of what, our brains want to do in a communication environment. And that agency of being able to control our attention is something that I think we're missing right now. But it also is a great opportunity to think about how do we bring that into our virtual environments in more dynamic ways that really it, you know, interact with us um, in a closed group manner and more authentically. So what, what else works? Um, I mean, you mentioned briefly the idea of m moving among different platforms so that you're not just stuck in a Zoom Brady Bunch box um, or God forbid, you know, WebEx or uh, something worse. You mentioned VR and AR. Um, so those are like different types of platforms. Like what other promising technologies or, or work or platforms are out there for um, both uh, relieving our, our Zoom fatigue, but also, you know, in terms of empathetic technologies? Well, I think, you know, they're, they're definitely, I think you're in the next year, going to year, year and a half, going to see a lot of integration of the, the sensors we have available and the amalgamation of that information, you know, with machine learning to be able to track more personal styles, behaviors of interaction. You know, right now we have that's sort of all um, suppressed. It's, you know, you, you may have people that want to interrupt in ways that are more visual. My body posture may indicate my engagement. My, um, you know, other dynamics you can pick from, up from, you know, some sort of uh, dynamics in my voice, in my, um, in, in my, uh, uh, the, the subtleties of, you know, how I, how I shift. Enabling that to be more dynamic. Again, it's, it's how do we, in, how do we proliferate those ways of having seamless interrupt uh, in the communications area. People, you know, one of the things you always target, because uh, at Dolby, we've been very active, you know, we've always um, uh, worked on spatial audio and the enterprise communication platforms. And that's, that's all about styles of interrupt. Uh, you, you know, successful interrupt, that's how we get from note to note in our mm. communication. So enabling that is, is a really important part. Mm. And right now we're just, it's, it's pretty clunky. And, um, you know, it, it's not just about sound. It's, it's not just about what I say. And it's not just about, you know, um, a one size fits all paradigm. And I think that's one of the most beautiful parts of what has really uh, risen up in some of these you know, ways of communicating is the important of personal, importance of personalization and how we uh, enable that, but also track it to allow uh, platforms and, and technology in these ways to become much more uh, tuned and optimized for everyone's style of engagement. So before we go there, I wanted to ask you, we were talking earlier about um, about music and I was actually earlier this week talking to the founder of an organization called healthtunes.org, um, which are, it's, it's a nonprofit um, organization. They give their product away for free. And the idea is that they are literally prescribing music therapy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they have a list of conditions that they can address, you know, from anxiety to and Alzheimer's to, you know, Parkinson's disease. Um, and they have all these uh, benefits that they're touting. Um, you know, what about binaural beats? What about, you know, music as medicine? Where are we with, with that? Music is medicine. That I, I absolutely believe it can be true. <laughs> you surround yourself with uh, stimuli that in, you know, can be targeted and target you to enrich your brain in certain ways. So my, my course at Stanford is called Neuroplasticity and Musical Gaming, but it's all 
about how do we harness you know aspects of music or of sound and and image, but really and think about the ways we can use technology to you know enhance our brains for capability, but also for rehabilitation and for you know learning and things. Binaural beats is an interesting one because there's I mean there's been a definite um, accelerate like a, a, a move towards. Uh, interest in binaural beats. And just for anyone that doesn't know, uh, I, you know a, a typical beat frequency will happen in, you know, in, in, in a coic sound, in acoustic sound, when you have two frequencies that are near to each other, but you know, say, so I have, I'm playing a 500 Hertz sound and I'm playing a 503 Hertz sound. I'm, you're going to hear a pulsation that's at three Hertz that you'll, you'll be able to, you'll, uh, experience as sort of, uh, you know, boom, 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 it'll it'll wallop <laughs> in and you know at, 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 that, at that frequency but the thing that happens with binaural beats and why they're interesting to people is they are only experienced perceptually you're putting that 500 hertz sound and that 503 hertz sound in two different ears right it's not happening in the acoustic waveform instead it's actually happening in the brain and you know, in academics, we've used those uh, as indicators of what's going, you know, what level of processing a particular perceptual phenomenon might be happening at. Because if if you experience things that can only be experienced by through a binaural perception, you, it gives you an idea of what level it's at. So then you go look neurally in in a certain part of the brain with an expectation, a hypothesis. But the thing about binaural beats that it it the similar phenomenon that I'm particularly uh, interested in is is maybe not binaural beats themselves, but what is it about that stimulus that people that that leads to some sort of beneficial impact to people or at least an experienced one? And there's you know another area I think we've talked about in the past, which was the the work from Lee Sui Sai at MIT and uh, Ed Boyden, uh, which was incredibly interesting. So that was work looking at, uh, and again, this was not in humans, this was in another, in I believe it's in rodent species, but looking at the impact of just 40 Hertz modulation and not to the body, like 40 Hertz sound, you know, um, AM modulation or 40 Hertz, you know, flashing lights, literally a rave for rats, you know, and, <laughs> and it, you know, and it reduced amyloid plaques for, you know, which, which in, and showed benefits in learning and memory like literally translation to a task. And, and like literally uh, reverse memory, they can yeah. re implant the memory. Yeah. And then yeah. It, it, breaking up. Things are beautiful. You don't know the mechanism. And I, I'll, I'll talk to Alzheimer's researchers who will be like, oh, you know, you know, different species, different this, but there's something there that, you know, is probably about stimulation of how you're engaging cellular um, waste removal in the brain. And, you know, but thinking about, okay, how do we harness this in a way and, and start thinking about that in our content in, you know, I, I work in a world of, you know, touching a lot of emotional and engaging music and entertainment content. And it becomes a very rich vehicle for how we think about how, how do we use this, not just for, you know, enhancing the emotions and memories we share with each other, but also as a, a, a method of uh, really uh, disseminating improved health um, um, opportunities. So I have to interject here because Lee Wave was um, talking about her research one time and said that, well, first of all, two things. One is um, I was at a performance uh, that Ed actually sponsored at the media, actually at the McGovern Institute um, at MIT, where he took 40 Hertz music sound um, mm -hmm. at 40 Hertz, and then they projected visuals at 40 Hertz. Because you were talking about um, you know, binaural beat maybe occurring at two different parts of your brain or being processed in two different parts of your brain. Maybe I'm confusing binaural versus the audio. Binaural meaning it has to be integrated. It has to be involving both hemispheres because you're, you know, the only way that that beat is ex in, exists is uh, at a level where you have integration from in information from both sides. Okay. Not necessarily cortically. This is like, you just know what stage okay. of that. Yeah. Okay. But if you're taking in um, the 40 Hertz sound, she yeah. was talking about wanting to get 40 Hertz Christmas tree lights. And I thought that was such a brilliant product idea, right? I mean, wouldn't that be nice to just enhance your, you know, Christmas environment or your holiday environment with binaural, be uh, no, sorry, with 40 Hertz sound? I mean, I think that's really yeah. No, I think that's beautiful as long as we, uh, 
we can also get people who design uh, all the digital Christmas lights to care about photosensitive epilepsy will be in a really good place. Because oh, well, <laughs> yeah, probably not there yet. <laughs> um, okay, well, so you talked about, um, you know, pulling in all this information and um, how that can help us, um, you know, reach a place of personalization and, and ultimately empathetic technologies, but it does reach um, this kind of privacy barrier for people. Mm -hmm. So I know you and I've talked about this a lot in the past. I know this is an issue that you care deeply about. You know, what is the solution? If, if you know, understanding where you are and personalizing the technology to where you are today versus yesterday versus tomorrow, you know, mm -hmm. how do we move forward with that kind of technology without completely giving up all of our privacy? Yeah. So you know, the dialogue started, the, you know, the things you're seeing in legislation are all in the right directions, but they're also missing some of the main way, main, main gaps that we need to think about. So uh, success of virtual environments, whether it's communication, whether it's health, you know, the, the confluence of uh, in, you know, sensors with unprecedented personalized data and the impact that can have for you know, personalized medicine and for uh, way, uh, ways of interacting in the future, aging in place, obviously a, a really important one, um, involve cap two, probably, likely two of the most important phenotypes uh, aside from capture of our cameras, our voice, which we can diagnose so many different um, <clears throat> clinical conditions based on the dynamics of a voice. And there, I think that's really gaining traction across a lot of companies, big and small, but also, um, you know, breath uh, being you know, used for diagnostics as well as emotion and, you know, and, and uh, quality of life uh, indicator. So you want to have this data be part of your health, you know, your digital democratized, but your digital signature that can be used and you know communicated to your healthcare providers. But you also want personal some of this personal data, there's a confluence between what can hap, you know, help in on, on my health front and what can actually empower my communication and you know the the, the breadth of individuals ac across the, the area. That being said, you know, if I look at something like voice, we are drastically behind in terms of thinking about data privacy from my from vocal uh, from vocal imprints you know vocal signatures it's an ambient signature it's one that you know as much as one may hope to uh you know control uh uh, uh how i in engage and give permission permissioning uh to a device to capture my voice it's going to be captured in environments and that i'm i have that that i have not because it's not device you know it's not tethered to my device uh there are a lot of ways technically, that we're able to think differently about what it means uh, to uh, create systems of speaker diarization, and, and things that have to happen before any processing can happen on a voice. And some of these, these, these technologies, I mean, they exist in different pieces and parts, but it, it's interesting to me how we think about this from the face. You know, we, we, we are absolutely much more uh, progressive in how we think about data privacy with regard to, I can capture an image, but I can't perform, you know, uh, additional analytic processing on faces and you'll see faces that are, you know, obscured and, and such. And, and that's an, you know, that's discussed in legislation. That's something I think is starting to, to rise up, but our voices are really the indicators of our mental and physical wellness, right? And, and we are way behind in how we think about that. And I think you know, getting that accelerated is important because we wanna be able to use the impact that our voice can have in providing us uh, in better experiences and better insight to our health. Mm -hmm. So the, um the conversation around artificial intelligence and machine learning and you know neural networks all this you know compiling of all this data um, you know leads you back to that famous course at Stanford you know where the uh, professor taught basically all the video game designers and social media designers how to make their applications sticky um, you know how do we how do we make sure that the data that we collect um, you know is is used for you know, well-being as opposed to business models, right? How can we get it from uh, being used in a ways that ultimately undermine our health and well-being? Yeah, well, we don't have the discussion of intent ever. It seems you know that that's a that's that's a word that's rarely used. Uh, aligning, 
you know, aligning those is, is the best thing. And you're definitely seeing more discussion of that. I know that, that that's how in the last two years, we're, we're moving in a very different direction, I, I, I believe. At least I know what conversations we have. And, um, but even the most innocuous technology, as much as we may try, is going to have deleterious impact, right? I, I think you know, a selfie filter has major implications on self-worth and, and social dynamics in certain cultures, but it was not, it, it, you know, it, it obviously wasn't thought about that way or perhaps it was, but it, you know, the, the, uh, the ramifications of that are about consideration of intent. So you know, if we take many technologies, it's about what we're going to do with the data and having more transparency to that. Right now, that's you know part of what's missing. Mm -hmm. um, I often use examples of like tracking emotions and uh, you know cognitive engagement of children in a school. And you know, because I, I like us to think hard about what's you know what is it that's wrong about that. I, you know, obviously that should you know prickle a lot of our uh, spidey senses in in that way, um, but you take those same things of children. Say, in some countries, we know that's happening, and it's being used to determine who moves forward, who moves back, based on their cognitive engagement with those more engaged. You know, you're you're doing resource allocation based on that sort of um, you know, idea, and and that that you know challenges a lot of ethics. But you can be doing the same thing. I can paint a, a scenario of you know children cognitive load kind of effort, emotion tracking in a, in a school and put it in a scenario of, you know, potentially an inner city school or something where we're seeing, you know, the groups we want to see most empowered not be empowered. And we need to break out of one size fits all the solutions. We need to, uh, you know, allocate more resources. It's about what we do with the data and thinking through the nefarious applications and creating more uh, regulation legislation around um, how those, that transparency happens. What do you guys do at Dolby? How do you talk about this internally? Like, do you have design criteria? Are there guardrails? Is there, you know, you mentioned the spidey sense, right? And it kind of reminds me of like, how do you define pornography? Like, I don't know it until I see it. And then it's like, oh, that's pornography and that's art. Um, you know, do you, do you have these conversations? Do you, are you part of a group of, of either internally or, or otherwise amongst neuroscientists who are trying to- So I can promise my teams have these conversations in spades. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, and I, I think it's really good because you have like you, and sometimes we just devote time solely to letting someone in our team, you know, it, I'll have, you know, someone from any level of the team come in and lead a, an ethics conversation or, you know, talk about something that they're concerned about. Um, we touch perception, you know, perceptual systems and emotional systems in, in very rich ways, which gives a lot of insight. You know, I can know what an audience is experiencing just based on, you know, the chemical composition of their breath. You start to think about, but but I also know all the problems we've built 50 years, you know, more than 50 years of not just Dolby, but the legacy technology we have in our environment is built for one size fits all. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, there's a lot of technologies designed for European white males and that it even, you know, crosses That's over right into now. our communication systems. You know, you can go back, there's a great article in the New Yorker, I forget who by, but about how uh, broadcast radio was really, and, and even early phone systems was designed for, you know, for the male voice. So it makes women sound shriller that makes them seem very, uh, you know, more, aggressive when they have to raise their, you know, anyhow, like even a headphone is designed for the male model. And so understanding how, you know, the way we saw that is with personal data, literally with anthropometric scans that we can do really fast, but then suddenly we're empowering, you know, uh, and we can look at the differences, we're empowering a different demographic, namely whether it's different ethnicity, whether it's a different sex and understanding that a lot of our technology is only best realized if we acknowledge that we actually do need to personalize it or we need to think broader about a one size fits all solution. And it's actually through machine learning and AI that we're able to do that, ironically. So <laughs> well, so how do you how do you avoid the bias in the algorithms? I mean, right? Because that's kind of where well, it's even what doesn't I mean your training sets are about the bias in the algorithms. In this case, it's about recognizing that, you know, like for a headphone, that's to create a spatial audio headphone, I have to I have to emulate how sound bounces off the human body. And that's been one, you know, a male mo European male model for then, you know, entire history of spatial audio. And how do we avoid it? Well, we actually 
build the out, you know, build the technology and the algorithms that take in enable us to personalize that technology. And once you personalize it, it's way different. And it's not just about it's better. It's about I don't get sick now. <laughs> it actually is for some people a very big shift. And it can be if I'm a professional gamer, it's it's a performance edge. If I'm, you know, if I'm a in an in you know communication environment like this, it's my cognitive load that lets me multitask or lets me be more, you know, have less stress. So all of these little things impact my wellness because they impact my mental effort. And they may differentiate me from somebody else, but it it can't be that they differentiate a demographic from right. another one. That's, you know, there's always success or failure of technology, but we can't let it be something that in any way ascribes to a particular, you know, different, you know, demographic. That's why I'm all about full personalization because that empowers diversity across the board. Perfect. Perfect. Because in fact, if that's what we're optimizing for, if that's what we're designing for, mm -hmm. uh, that's what's going to make everybody feel better, be more productive, be happier, buy more of that technology because it's working best for them. So then, you know, what we need to do is just close that feedback loop, right? So that that is, we've aligned the business model with that feeling no. of being. Absolutely. You know, the fact we don't see a lot of female professional gamers may be because the technology doesn't support them as well, right? Yeah. And so we have to actually look for those spots. And I feel like that dialogue has happened in the last year in partly because of how dependent we are on these different types of virtual technology communication streams. And that part I'm really excited about because it's, I mean, excited, but there's like so much to do, but people are starting to open, you know, open the, the doors and think a little differently about what it means and why you may have demographic differences in places where technology is part of that realization of, within the experience. Well, I totally love the fact that you have taken this opportunity to find the silver lining in the quarantine. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, I, I thought we were going to wrap up, but I just got three more minutes. Is there anything else you'd yeah. like to say? Uh, no, I think we're going to have a very, I mean, from a neuroplasticity perspective, we're, we are going to be different humans when we come out of this. I think that's that's no question, whether it's us, whether it's, you know, I have a five-year-old, I listen to their Zoom calls, and it's it's often the adults that have difficulty. Adult, adult is stressed, adult drops off the teacher in some cases, and it's a bunch of five-year-olds who are our next leaders going, okay, we've lost them. What do we need to do? Can we help him? Can we bring him back? Well, I think, you know, screen's frozen. Let's try, you know, and they're, they're busy doing this. And as, you know, that might seem scary to some people like, oh no, screens. But these minds are engaged in amazing ways and dealing with the situation in, in, and, you know, we are different humans every time we engage with new technology. As long as we approach it from, this is, this is what's happening. We are in, we are empowered, and we are thinking through the things that we're going to want to recover, and and also the things that have happened because of this type of uh, virtual and, and digital environment that we're living in. In with regard to, the, the, it's an opportunity. Um, love that. I love that. So the takeaways: if you're trying to manage your own like neuroplasticity during quarantine. <laughs> um, you mentioned a few. So you mentioned um, mix up your environments, right? So you're not yeah. on Zoom all day long. Um, what are other platforms that you could uh, suggest people use? Well, turn off your video, definitely. And as a company, encourage everyone to do it because otherwise there are connotations about engagement that I think persist across different demographics. You know, and you've got to enforce something as I say enforce, but you have to make it you know, ubiquitous across the um, way of behaving because otherwise, it, so don't rely on, you know, do anything to not sit and stare at yourself when you're talking. But yes, phone is phone is actually really important because what happens when we're on Zoom, when we're on these virtual calls is we don't take notes. We don't, my memory, I'm very visual. I am, I can, you know, r retrace a, you know, people are either chronological and this is a place where you can end up with demographic differences. People are very chronological in, in how they form their memories, or they can be very, um, you know, anchored to time, anchored to how they're like, you know, episodic in that way, or they can be very semantic and you get actually gender differentiation, you know, when you look at these globally. So when you start to think about who's being most impacted by, by certain ways of having to deal with memory and stuff, you start to potentially see demographic differences and who benefit you. Know, and, you don't want that. So you, you need to create more uh, opportunity for shift, shifting things. So phone, different forms of communication that are, you know, within the, you know, you're going to see differences in Zoom, but also 
go into AR sometime. Like I said, the alt space VR, be an avatar, not because it's you know fun to be an avatar, but because now you can, the, the most important part of that is being able to move between conversations and you know have divided attention. And I think you've called it continuous atten you know, partial attention, but both of those, our brains really want to do that. And it feels amazing for just even uh, you know, a community. And it feels amazing also in the sense that after you've met with people in that environment, you feel closer to them than you do in this one at times. And I think it's worth enabling that occasionally. Mm -hmm. Wow. wow. <laughs> love that. Absolutely love that. And and so, you know, I guess the big meta takeaway would be consider um, every day how the way you're working could enhance your plasticity. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like think about it. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and make a lot of eye contact out of this, out of these platforms because we're definitely not doing it in them. So. <laughs> Well, wow, you two. I could just listen to you forever. Um, that was so wonderful and so informative. And, um, you know, I just feel so fortunate to have um, two people like you in, in um, my world so we can share ideas. And so thank you so very much. Well, thank you for the work you're doing to raise awareness around the importance of these technologies. And I'm really looking to you to be, you know, part of the movement that mobilizes us all to insist that our own well-being is, um, you know, is rewarded. That there are reward and incentives and, and structures in place for those positive feedback loops to really transform the way technology impacts us.